Oh, loud. <laughs> thank you um, for the intro, and yeah, thank you for having me at this nice venue. Um, as already mentioned, already saw some familiar faces, so... Okay. Great. Some facts about Digimondos. Um, we are a vendor of an IoT platform, especially for utility companies. We are serving right now 100 plus grid operators, not everyone directly, but some of them indirect via system integrators, nationwide and also international. Right now we have like 350K devices in our system in operation. Um, when you think about, about the potential, this seems like a high number, but all our customers together have probably 10 million plus metering points. So the adoption is still really, yeah, really low. So three to 4%. And yeah, right now we are basically trying to serve 60 different um, use cases, but always starting with a problem we're trying to solve with new innovative IT solutions. And my, my task there is like being the translator between the new world, what's possible, and like the old world, because utilities are very, very conservative. So it's not that easy to highlight a solution, even though you have like a positive ROI and getting immediately adoption. So it really takes time and you have to build trust. I think a lot of uh, messages we heard in the panel discussion before. So I, we are doing a survey every year with every of our utility companies and asking, okay, what are your top three challenges you're trying to address, hopefully with our solution or basically IoT in general. One is, of course, the decreasing workforce. So as an energy company, you have to operate very, very complex grid, different, um, different grid, grids, electricity, heat, water, and so on. And you have less and less technicians to do that. So you have to provide them the right tools to yeah, maintain their grid, maintain a high service level, a high uptime, and of course, delivering business value to them. Because if you're not solving a problem for your end customer, basically that is a department inside a utility, then the adoption won't be there. Then a section, uh, or a second point is regulatory or regulation. We heard that as well. The EED coming from the EU, um, now forcing German energy companies to integrate remote meter reading solutions, especially for the heat grid, that provides at least one meter reading per month and one meter reading per year that can get built. And also, for example, in the substations, and that's an example in the electricity grid where we did some projects, gained some insights. Um, I will a little bit more expand on an example, but this leads to more and more data. The problem is when you have a very conservative um, customer who's not really familiar with the new technologies, getting more and more data can be overwhelming. So for example, if you're talking with a billing department, they only want to have like one meter reading a year to get their billing. If you're talking with the guys who are in charge for the operation of the grids, they want as much data as they can have so they can reason on that data and act on that data and drive efficiency in their processes. And this is, for example, a nice project that really highlights all the challenges but also the benefits. It's um, substations um, for the electricity grid that facing right now server problems. Of course, the rising vol volatility that's coming from all the EV cars, decentralized energy generation by solar panels, and especially in Germany right now, the adoption of heat pumps. So that brings way more volatility to the grid, and that leads to more complex operational tasks and basically a challenge for the customer, that is then the grid operator. Right now, I would say 90% of these substations are completely in blind operation. So there is a person driving there once a year, checking some numbers. And of course, when there is like a circuit um, 
outage, for example, the customer, the utility serving, gives you a call. That's very expensive. Um, trying to solve it this way through the customer, and it's not, yeah, if you want to have like a happy customer, it's not the best idea, delivering not the, uh, the quality you expect. And we have rising maintenance costs because the infrastructure getting more and more complex. It's really, really old. So we heard about 50 to 60 years a substation um, is on the balance sheet. So that means the only way to get transparency into these substations is by installing retrofit sensors, for example. Because right now, if you order or if you install a new substation, they are already fully digitized, often directly connected um, to the control center. So there, there's no real need of implementing an IoT solution. So these are the challenges we were coming from, and this is what we basically did. We just installed a couple of sensors. We started with uh, yeah, 30 substations that basically our customer chose because there they had the most problems with. And the first idea is, okay, they had taken these substations that are pretty far away. No, they did the exact opposite. They installed the first um, or equipped the first 30 substation that qu quite nearby because if they have an outage and they don't know where, they can directly know, okay, these one aren't the uh, identified assets they, they have to drive to, so they have saved time and taking the longer um, drive. So we installed, as you can see at the top right of the corner, um, just door sensor, like controlling or monitoring the entrance, of course, short circuit detection. Sometimes you have to install a sensor for that. Sometimes there is already a sensor where you can use an interface and just getting the data out of the substation. Voltage and power measurements, of course. Um, this is something I, I highlight later on. Transformer and room temperature, because if it's rising, it will take a um, not long time for an outage. So you can act on that data and you solve the problem. And of course, like the SF6 gas, monitoring with SF6 gas, um, the pressure there, because it's a very toxic gas for the environment. Like, I'm not too familiar with chemical stuff, but it's the worst case what can happen in a substation, in my opinion. So we did that with 30 stations. We had a quite good ROI, as everybody talked about, and we thought, okay, with this nice, um, project we kicked off where we have like a proven ROI, we really accelerated the adoption. Problem was, even though you have like an Excel sheet that explains directly, okay, how much time you save per substation, all that stuff, the adoption is not really coming. So what we did then is we did some pilots with other uh, utilities just for free, learning on the job, explaining to the end customer how to work with the data and trying to really understand what is needed to accelerate this adoption. And one is on the right side is the integration in the core processes. Because I think on the left side, everybody is familiar to that because otherwise they don't knew L'Oreal or the other people who are delivering software for a Pivan operating system. But yeah, what we're doing is implementing sensors, all that stuff, having like a private LP1 or maybe using narrowband IoT. So we are quite open to that. But the value is generated here because there is the system, the IT and OT legacy system that needs to get the data because otherwise the people who are actually in charge of operating the grid and doing all these maintenance jobs they don't want to work with a second screen. They want to work with the data in their system. And it's not that easy because some of them, for example, the workforce management system, is just not able to get data every 15 minutes or every hour. It's, the system is not designed for that. So we are doing this in our IoT platform, adding also context like asset IDs from the GIST system and trying to provide as much information to the person who gets the alarm as possible. And then we have a direct interface to the control system. So that's a completely different protocol. It's a SCADA protocol, IEC 104. So we have to translate from adjacent to IEC 104 um, protocol, forwarding the data there, and then 
it's critical infrastructure, so it has to be on-premise, like one more requirement we learned that is important. With the Lovion system, for example, there will be automatically get a, a ticket created, so when there is like an outage on the horizon or there is some anomalies in the data that we are getting, it's automatically creating a ticket, so the technician basically never sees our software. He only gets like a ticket in his normal workflow and see, okay, I have to drive to this substation and do like an intermediate um, control there. And number one, that's a little bit more for the long shot, is like providing the data into basically a hyperscalar a data center so they can do AI stuff on that. But I think that's still, yeah, there's still a lot of improvement and there's still a lot of data needed to actually can do this modeling. So now coming to the quantified benefits, because I think this is everybody searching for. So we were a long time on the search for this holy grail, like the use case that drives basically device growth, um, getting us new customers. What we did, for example, with the substation is that we reduce the need for planned inspection trips by 82%. So they're checking this once per year. Now they're checking this every six years. So we're right now still in the pilot phase where they learn with the system, can they really trust the data? But from the technicians we are talking with or the people who are in charge for this uh, whole grid operation, we are quite optimistic. But still, adoption is not there. So at the beginning, I said regulation can be a driver. So we have right now a law in Germany that forces every utility company to digitize their substations on the one hand or install a lot of smart meters. And everybody who's familiar to the German energy market knows how long this takes to install like electricity meter, like a smart meter gateway. What we also did is we, of course, improved response time to act on a short circuit, so they directly knew where the short circuit is, can directly drive there with the right, uh, right equipment, and yeah, helping just reducing the time and reducing the stress for the employees, because as I had said at the beginning, it's the same workforce, have to operate a more and more complex grid with the same tools, and so we're trying to solve that. And yeah, last but not least is like this, automated uh, fault resolution process. So it's not just that we're providing the information, we're also providing the insight in the right system, for example, in the Lovian system, so that the technician who has this oily, bumpy finger doesn't need to work like on a smartphone or a tablet when he's on the drive. He only can just work with his normal uh, workflows he's familiar with. So if you guys want to chat later on about how to drive adoption. I'm happy to share our insights because I think it helps all of us. So sometimes uh, we start as competitors, then we evolve to co-opetition, I would say, like building the ecosystem. I think right now to tackle the challenges I mentioned at the beginning, the only way is by yeah, having like a fruitful ecosystem and having very close partnerships where you can trust and also build trust for the end customer. Because if some of the so if a word, your partners fuck up in the process of trying to prove a value, you will lose trust, even though it's not your part or not, not your failure. So happy to connect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John.